How long did it take to write it? <sighs> it took more than 34 years to write rationality in the structure of the cell. The reason it took that long is because for a long time I did not realize that I was working on just one project. I had to publish really several articles before I started realizing that they were all connected. I made the very difficult decision uh, that I was not going to rush it out because I felt under great internal and also external pressure to do the best work I was capable of doing, you know. I knew that none of my colleagues, whether within the department or in the field generally, would give me the benefit of the doubt, having to do with length or the quality of the argument or inconsistencies or anything like that. So I did not publish it in time for my tenure review, and of course uh, I didn't get tenure, but you know that was okay. Um, and after that, I kept on working on it and teaching it. I taught many different parts of it in many different courses over 30 years, and publishing some of it. But the process of bringing it to completion was very much like the process of focusing a camera lens where the image just gets sharper and sharper and you start seeing the relationship of the different parts to one another in this gestalt picture. But see, you can't see them just vaguely because that means that there are details and applications and counter-arguments that haven't been dealt with. So it's not enough to just kind of brush it in in this very vague and general gestural way. It really had to be both precise and also comprehensive. And that's what took all this time. It just took a very long time for all of the parts and the interrelationships among the parts to come into focus. Why is that so important? in your work, that need for systematic coherence? It's because in the best of all possible worlds, what is really true would not have to be sacrificed to the requirements of system. You would have both. You would have the right system referring to the reality that actually exists. You know, not a kind of make-do system, you know, this kind of seat-of-the-pants system that we have to keep changing because reality is so complicated we can't make sense of it. We would get it right because the system itself would be grounded in veridical perception of what is really there. And because I think I myself am so often the object of superimposed systems of thought of stereotypes that don't fit, it has a special meaning for me. Not only that other people get me right, but that I get reality right. Because, you know, if, if I can't do that for myself, then I have no right to judge other people's fumbling attempts. Did you feel pressures to publish it in a less acceptable state? Oh, absolutely, both before tenure and after I did get tenure. Some people were interested in some parts of it and wanted to publish those parts of it, which in my mind would not have made sense without other parts of it. There were other occasions on which I was invited to publish something and could not bring a part of the project to the level of quality that I felt it needed to be at within that um, deadline. And so there was pressure to produce and demonstrate to people that 
I was productive enough in the field of philosophy so that some special arrangement would be justified to accommodate my other field. But I really did feel that the only thing that was important in the end was the quality of the work. Because, you know, we're all going to die. And all of the power relationships and all of the negotiations about status and position and favor and approval and quid pro quo, all of those things that define professional relationships are going to dissolve. They're going to disappear. And what will be left is the work. I remember about maybe 20 years ago, the Journal of Philosophy published an issue in which they reproduced the program for an American Philosophical Association Eastern Division Conference that had taken place maybe a hundred years before. And I'll never forget the impression that this program made on me because it was full of symposia for this philosopher and that philosopher and talks by this philosopher and that philosopher. And the only names that were familiar to me were John Dewey and Charles Sanders Peirce. So all of that effort put into achieving status and power and position, in the end it didn't matter. All that mattered was the quality of the work. And so I just had to make the decision that nothing would be more important to me than doing work that was the best quality I personally could possibly achieve. And it would just have to take as long as it took. How has publishing it digitally worked? It's been a mixed bag. On the one hand, it has been very, very good that people can access it immediately. And lots of people have read it. I've gotten huge amounts of hits at my website. I, 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 I can't even go there. I, I, it, I, it just overwhelms me and intimidates me. I feel very exposed. <laughs> um, but I'm very, very happy that people are reading it. And I'm also extremely gratified by what people have said about it. On the other hand, it's been disappointing and also very much a cautionary tale for me how afraid people are to say publicly what they have said privately to me or anonymously. At least to this point in time, no one has been willing to express their evaluations publicly. When given the opportunity, uh, people have either refused to say anything or they have said very different things than what they've said to me privately. So. What I, what I learn from this, the lesson that I get from this, is not simply about hypocrisy, because it really is not that simple. It has to do with the fragility of being in a position of power in the first place. You know, we always think that were we truly powerful and if we could move mountains, if we had that authority and status, we could ameliorate so many problems. But the reality is that the more power you have, the more enemies you have, and the more people are waiting to take you down. And so you have to be very, very careful about what you say, who you might offend, what connections you might threaten by saying the wrong thing or by giving approval to the wrong person or project. And so the result is that those individuals who are most in positions of power
are in fact most powerless to express their real views. So that's a, you know that's an important lesson for me, and you know I'm I'm sorry because I would of course love for my work to reach an even wider audience through the medium of people who said in print or in digital media that these books are worth reading and that they're important and all of that, but I I, I can't make that happen. And in the end, it doesn't matter. Because when people are able to make those judgments, maybe in two or three generations, younger scholars will have no personal stake, no worry about offending other powerful people. And the books will be there for them to read. And I feel sure they will be read. In talking to some people in the field, Almost unanimously, people would say that the work was great, um, that they felt that it was very valuable, a very valuable, very unique contribution. Right. Um, and when I would talk to them about the publication issues that you had, mm -hmm. what does it mean for you to have published it digitally? Mm -hmm. you know, what, does that mean? what sort of risks are involved? And, and almost unanimously, everyone said that they thought for sure it would affect the number of readers. Mm -hmm. Um, that digital publishing was the wave of the future, ultimately. So in some ways, you're in the you know, avant-garde in that respect. But also that you know, they hoped people would read it. Right. It strikes me as a similar uh, circumstance to some of the things you've done in the art world. So you've remained independent you know, from galleries for the most part, and you've worked with galleries, of course, but you know, never really committed to one um, and always had as much control as possible over your work, if not full control. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it seems that this is a similar choice. Yes, that's interesting, yes. In the art world, there's a sense in which that can be looked on as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I'm sure it has produced sacrifices and so forth, but there's also something cool to being the outsider, to being the independent. Right. Um, and if that's different in philosophy or not, or if there are more risks involved with that choice. Uh, that's, that, that's a really interesting question. I think it's also true in philosophy that to be an outsider or the outsider, take your pick, has something edgy and sexy about it. Um, it's to be in the tradition of Nietzsche. But I think because philosophy is a more regimented field and more highly structured by professional conventions. The risks are indeed greater. But at the same time, and here I have to come back to the public-private distinction, people cheer me on privately. You know, they, they watch with interest and enthusiasm as I make my way through this professional morass. <laughs> and I know that because they respect the work, I know they wish the best for me. So it's not that there is no attraction of being an independent and of being an outsider. There definitely is. And you know, philosophy, I think, is no different than any other field in that way. But it really is so very dependent in a way that is incompatible with the values that Socrates be bequeathed to us, so dependent on professional hierarchy that it's easy uh, to view what has happened to me as a process of punishment for having violated certain conventions, you know, for having failed to toe the line, for having blown the whistle on certain practices. But again, I have to come back to that decision that I made a long time ago, that none of that could matter. The only thing that matters is the quality of the work, doing the very best work I can, getting it out there, making it accessible for people to read when they are ready to do that.
I can't do any more than that. Well, there are two volumes. The first volume is devoted to a critique of the prevailing conception of the self, which is the Humean conception. And then the second volume proposes an alternative conception of the self that incorporates the Humean conception into it as a special case. So in the first volume, I begin by critiquing the models that constitute the Humean conception of the self, the belief-desire model of motivation and the utility-maximizing model of rationality. And I show that there are certain inconsistencies just within the formulations of those two models, you know, quite aside from how they're used in moral theory or political theory. And then uh, in the rest of the book, I basically critique particular theorists and particular positions trying to resolve these three problems that the Humean conception of the self generates. The problem of moral motivation, the problem of rational final ends, and the problem of moral justification. And I show that these three are interconnected. The problem of moral motivation arises because if we are only motivated by desire, and the satisfaction of desire is inherently self-satisfying, then it seems that we cannot explain moral motivation that requires self-sacrifice, that requires altruism, that requires disinterested action on behalf of other people. The problem of rational final ends comes up because the Humean conception claims that reason is only an instrument for the realization of whatever ends we have in mind, whatever ends we desire to achieve. And if that's true, then the question is whether any ends can be rationally justified that diverge from the ends that we happen to have as the result of the desires we happen to have. The problem of moral justification is a special case of that problem because moral theorists who construct substantive normative moral theories are essentially presenting us with a set of ends that they believe are rationally justified. These ends may have to do with how to conduct oneself, how to behave in a friendship, how social organizations should be structured, what society should look like. These are ends that they try to convince us that we should achieve. But of course, if they can't be justified except as the outcome of desires we happen to have, then if our desires don't lead us in that direction, then they can't be justified at all. So I talk about um, many, many different moral theorists who have engaged with these problems, and I show how all of them get tripped up by the assumption that the self is to be understood as the Humean conception of the self requires. And I end that first volume by suggesting that, well, you know, this, this is not working. <laughs> uh, so we have to move on and look at a more recent, more complex conception of the self that Kant basically formulated in partial response to his reading of Hume. Now, the second volume of the project is not an exegetical one. It does not defend an interpretation of Kant, but it's very clearly inspired by Kant. And I think what makes my version of a Kantian model of, of uh, morality different is that I ground the model not simply in Kant's moral writings, but rather in the critique of pure reason. Most people think that the moral writings can be examined and understood independently of what Kant did in the critique of pure reason, and I disagree with that. I think that you have to have a grounding in the critique in order to understand the groundwork, the second critique, all of his later moral writings.
so the conception that I develop is different in that way. Whereas the Humean conception gives two models, one of motivation, one of rationality, and interlocks them. I offer one model, which is essentially a model of inductive and deductive reasoning as that is traditionally understood. So there are no fireworks here. You know, there, there, there are no radical proposals about how rationality is to be understood or about how uh, reason works or how deliberation works. What I do suggest is that this very traditional model can perform both functions simultaneously. It can give you a model of motivation and a model of rationality. So I develop um, the model as it should be understood under ideal conditions in the first part of the book. And then in the second part of the book, I try to chart some of the ways in which our actual behavior deviates systematically from that model. So the point is to propose a model and also show how the model applies, how it, be, how it can be confirmed by the actual experiences we have. At the end of the first volume, you say that you basically conclude that this isn't working. What's not working about it? Well, there's so many things that are not working about it. <laughs> The criteria I use to judge that it's not working have to do with the solution of these three problems that it generates. There really is no way to understand moral motivation if all you have to work with is desire. Because there are things that we do that conflict with our desires, that require that we sacrifice our desires, and we do them wholeheartedly from this perspective that the psychology of desire alone simply cannot explain. Many different theorists have offered all of these complicated epicycles about how desire can work and how it can fill the gaps that seem to come up. I'm thinking about um, uh, Frankfurt and Rawls and Bernard Williams. You know, they all offer attempts to try to accommodate the desire model of motivation so that it can explain what moral motivation does. And, and they're not successful. They, they, they simply are not successful. Humean moral philosophers like to think that they can settle the question of whether a final end is rational or not by simply saying, well, you know, if we affirm it, if it's really our end, if it's essential to our integrity, if it's a basic ground project, you know, kind of using this sort of emotional language to, to, to kind of pump it up, that somehow that will show that such an end is therefore rational, and it just doesn't work. Just, just doesn't work. And you can give lots of counterexamples, but, you know, just trust me, it doesn't work. Um, and then on the matter of moral justification, most of the leading moral theories of the late 20th century justify the theory on the basis of this conception of the self. Either they try to derive the substantive theory from this conception which is entirely value neutral, and that doesn't work, or they try to argue that anyone who has desires and who satisfies certain other basic conditions will end up choosing a certain form of social organization or a certain uh, set of social arrangements, and that also doesn't work. You know, you have to look at the details of the theories, but trust me, doesn't work. <laughs> One of the challenges, at least in getting early readers for the for the presses, was that it was being sent to you know, 30 Humean philosophers. More than 30 refused to read it. And I want to pick up on that in terms of what that says about how philosophy is being approached. Thomas Kuhn 
developed this notion of the paradigm, the explanatory paradigm. And he argued that in the sciences, an explanatory paradigm gets its power in part by the number of important scientists who subscribe to it, who use it, who develop its implications, who formulate experiments that either confirm or disconfirm it, and that this paradigm does change over time as anomalous data comes in that disconfirms it, the paradigm is then refined, revised, and ultimately replaced by a new paradigm. And essentially it's the same in philosophy. The current paradigm is the Humean conception of the self. This is the dominant conception that's been so deeply entrenched in Anglo-American analytic philosophy that one of the most important authors that I deal with in the book, Thomas Nagel, whose main aim was to find an alternative to this paradigm, could not think his way out of it. His book, The Possibility of Altruism, is such a rich, deep, original, important book. And there's a point in the book where he says, we have to find a way to understand how altruistic action can be motivated in the absence of desire. But how could there be an absence of desire? What could, what could we even mean by talking about there being no desire to motivate the self? And that's the essence of the human conception. And so, uh, you know, of course in the book I take him to task for that. <laughs> but for me, it was such a lesson to realize that someone who really wanted so much to find an alternative was so inculcated with this picture of human motivation that he, he, he just could not get outside it. He, he, he really could not. And so that shows the strength of the paradigm. You know, it's reinforced by work in behaviorist psychology. It's reinforced by Freud. It's reinforced by neoclassical economics which places this paradigm at its foundation. So there are many ways in which the paradigm just overtakes one's thought processes and makes it extremely difficult to dislodge. Why do we need that paradigm shift? We need that paradigm shift from desire to a richer conception of human motivation because we need to start exploring the ways in which our capacity for thought itself affects and influences the actions that we take and the decisions that we make. Because the capacity to reason, the capacity to think, to think abstractly, to range in space and time over any corner of the universe, to, to think beyond the boundaries of the universe with our minds is, is a huge, huge undertaking. And we don't, I think, really appreciate what it is we're doing when we do that. The concept of the self that I would like to defend is a much more comprehensive one. It definitely includes desire. It definitely includes emotion. It includes all of those basic instincts and feelings and reactions that partially define us. But my point is, number one, they do not fully define us. My second point is that even if you look at the ego, just the ego alone, which is a very complex entity, including not only those reactions, but also the ability to think, to conceptualize, to generalize, to abstract, to apply, to infer,
all of those operations are also part of the self and they are the part of the self that link the ego with this broader conception of the self that enables us to act in ways that are self-sacrificing. I like to think that this notion is implicit in certain traditional concepts that are part of the Anglo-American analytic um, vocabulary. Um, it has to do with impartiality, impersonality, it has to do with self-reflection, being able to see oneself from a distance, being able to see other per persons as just as real as oneself. These are concepts that other philosophers have dealt with. When we talk about a society structured by self-interest, we mean egoistic, narrow self-interest. But there's a wider sense of self that also might provide structure for a society in which the distinction between self and other is not based so much on the conflict of egos, but rather on seeing and being able to imagine the commonality of experience. And in order for that to happen, we need to work real hard on exercising our imagination. You know, the moment we start to demonize another person, the moment we start to speculate about what their internal motives must have been in order for them to have behaved as they did. We need to just put on the brakes and come to a grinding halt and just start trying to imagine how the world looks from that person's point of view. And I mean really, you know, viscerally and kinesthetically experience that. As we develop the capacity of imagination, we develop the ability to interact with others transpersonally, not to feel so defensive when our narrow self-interests are being threatened, but, uh, you know, more alert to the broader transpersonal and social implications of particular courses of action. I mean, I think all of that is available, all of those capacities that can lead us there, we use instrumentally in order to realize objects of desire, which are always fleeting and ultimately unsatisfactory and always leave us feeling disappointed and empty and then we have to go on to the next one and then we're just little hamsters on a wheel. It's not good. Desire is definitely an essential part of us, but the question is whether desire is the only thing that can be causally efficacious in motivating action. And Nagel's mistake, I think, was to assume that only desires could have this role. Thoughts could be important in formulating principles, but they did not have causal efficacy because thoughts refer to abstract events, thoughts refer to propositions. These are abstract objects. How can an abstract object cause you to do something? So I think that the solution is to acknowledge that even though thoughts refer to abstract objects and they express abstract propositions, a thought occurrence is itself an event. It is an event in the brain. If it is an event in the brain, it can be causally efficacious. That means that our thoughts can motivate us to do something independently of what our desires are motivating us to do. It's not that desires are not in there. The question is whether the thought or a belief or a conviction has stronger causal force or not than a desire that may or may not conflict with it. And essentially what I, what I suggest is that thoughts can be enormously powerful. Thought events can spur us to action. It happens all the time. You do talk quite a bit about self-preservation and that we're often acting and thinking in, in, in the mode of self-preservation to keep our sense of self coherent. What I mean by literal self-preservation is the drive to preserve the coherence of the self against 
the incursion of conceptual and experiential anomaly. Anomalies that don't fit comfortably into our conceptual schemes, that present us with puzzles or traumas or shocks when we encounter them, that make us boggle <laughs> when we try to explain them, and that often uh, motivate people to kill those who represent them. So this, this battle is a battle for ego preservation. It's a battle for the preservation of the boundaries of the person against what lies outside those boundaries. The claim is not that all of our experiences are, in fact, internally consistent. It is simply that those that are not consistent with a certain perspective we have on our experience, the, pers the agent's perspective that allows us to, to walk across the room, those that are not consistent with that perspective do not come into consciousness at all. And that, you know, that comes directly from Kant. Those experiences may still affect us causally. They may still influence our behavior. But they are not part of the world that we can conceptually grasp in the way we need to in order to reason and make plans about what to do next. If we can narrow things down to what is manageable psychologically, then we have only a small array of options from which to choose in our actions, when in fact the situation that we're confronted with is always so overwhelmingly complex that we simply don't have the cognitive capacity to process it. And so we often assume the stance of what amounts to disingenuous innocence. The things that I don't know, I don't have to deal with, and please don't tell me about them, because if you do, I won't be able to deal with anything. That's, that's the attitude. Why would I want to change that attitude? What you learn when you are confronted with unavoidable realities that are very complex is that there is a process that the mind has by which one gradually learns to deal with those situations and absorb the complexity of the information and achieve a greater wisdom, a greater insight into the situation than one can possibly have by just oversimplifying everything in the way that we are naturally inclined to do. And when you learn that sort of thing, you just get smarter, you get wiser, and you get more interesting. You're not boring anymore. How do you actually know that you're not being self-deceptive? I've done it before. Mm -hmm. I've been working on it. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not being self-deceptive. Mm -hmm. But then I felt that way the last time I did this yeah. too. Right, right. It's, it's extremely difficult. I can only speak on a personal level about this. But I'm a master of self-deception, or a mistress of self-deception. <laughs> um, and um, I consider my capacity for self-deception to be infinite. The only thing that works for me is to always take a stance of epistemic skepticism towards what I currently think. I simply have to subject it to all of the checks and balances and tests that one would su subject any suspicious hypothesis to in the process of research. That's the only thing that works. And now for that, it really is essential for me to keep a journal because the journal is the place where I record what I think. And that's what enables me to compare what I think now with what I thought the last time I engaged in this. So if you can treat the states of the mind and the states of the self as data, as events that need to be analyzed and subject to the same principles of investigation, as any scientific endeavor, 
then you can maybe start achieving maybe a little bit of clarity about that. But you know, it's really tough. It's really tough. That, that, that for me is the biggest problem. The problem of self-deception is what in yoga philosophy is called avidya, ignorance. And ignorance arises from the tendency of desire to distort one's thought processes so that one ends up rationalizing the object of one's desire. It's a very tough process. It's what yoga philosophy is all about. You keep a journal? I've, I've kept a journal uh, since I was uh, 11. And do you go back and read it often? The only time to date that I've had the privilege of going back and rereading all of my journals was when I turned 40. And it was better than 20 years on the couch. It was really very illuminating and very humbling. So that was about trying to assess or judge oneself as good. How about the other? How about trying to, to evaluate someone else's actions? Well, I myself always swing back and forth between making judgments based on my emotional reactions and trying to correct those judgments based on my limited understanding of what it would be like to be that person. And, you know, if my emotional reactions are positive, then the judgments I make are positive. <laughs> but that doesn't make them true, you know. And, of course, if the emotional reactions are negative, then I really go to town on the person. I just inflict enormous damage with the judgments that I make. And then after having written down all of these scathing judgments, really quite cutting judgments uh, about the other person, then I think, uh, well, you know, actually, I've done that myself, <laughs> you know, sometimes. <laughs> and then I go back and, you know, just, no, I don't, I, you know, I don't erase anything. I, I just leave it all there. But, but it's, it's, it's very humbling. You know, it's very humbling. And, and, and the moment, which for me is so useful and so important and so central to this notion of transpersonal rationality, is when you realize that in order for the judgments that you're making about someone else to be true, they have to hold for you under the same circumstances, in the same conditions. And as soon as you start applying the judgments you make about other people to yourself, you realize that most of the time you really are not justified in making judgments about other people at all. In the yogic and Vedantic tradition, it's understood as being self-evident that desire is the cause of illusion. Desire is what leads you into ignorance and leads you into false hypotheses about everything. I take my contribution to that discussion to be an analysis of the way that happens, the way our desire for the truth of a certain settled, familiar conception of the world itself pulls our capacity for reason off course, pulls it off balance, and leads us to engage in these processes by which we construct a world that is based on fallacy. It's based on false reasoning. It's based on incorrect application of concepts. It's based on ignoring important parts of the data simply because they are too threatening for us. And that's the way illusion is constructed. There are other conceptions of the self. The one to be found in yoga and Vedanta it involves not simply mental associations, but what the intellect is capable of when it has been disciplined by scholarship and by meditation. Part of what you can find out by doing that kind of meditation is not only how free associations work, but how the intellect works. And so 
when you're looking at the intellect, you're now looking at it from yet some further perspective that encompasses the intellect, the mind, the feelings, and so forth, right? Did you have concerns bringing your interest in Eastern philosophies into your work in Western philosophy? Or do you even see them as separate? I did not see them as separate, but it was very clear to me that Anglo-American analytic philosophy did not view Vedic philosophy, Indian philosophy in general, as part of the discipline. And I think that that is really a very great shame because a great deal of work in Anglo-American analytic philosophy does in fact have to do with the, the constitution and the structure of the self. You know, this comes into epistemology, it comes into philosophy of mind, it comes into philosophy of science, it comes into philosophy of mathematics. And because analytic philosophy does not draw on the tradition of Vedic and Indian philosophy, there's a whole range of resources that it simply does not have. So although my own work in analytic philosophy does draw on those resources, it was extremely problematic for me to even bring them up. And I think before rationality and the structure of the self, the only time I ever brought up, even mentioned Indian philosophy, was as a counterexample in an article that I wrote very early on in order to show that there were other ways of thinking about the problem under discussion. And I did that only in a footnote. You know. <laughs> Everything that goes on in um, uh, analytic philosophy is based on the assumption of ego psychology. You simply cannot make sense of, of cognitive phenomena unless you assume that the individual, as a psychological entity, is constituted of ego functions. Now, Vedic philosophy agrees that there are ego functions and agrees that that is part of the self, but denies that that is a full representation of the self. It claims that there are other aspects of the self that go beyond the ego, that inform and support the ego, that have varying relationships to the ego. You know, it really is a very, very finely worked out psychological view. But you can't squeeze it or shoehorn it into a view about um, behaviorism, say, or Freudianism, or um, the appropriate object of cognitive science. In one tradition, so much is excluded that there are a lot of things you just can't make sense of at all. Whereas in this other tradition, which is much older and richer and deeper, all of those things are included, and a lot more. What's beyond the ego? What is there beyond the ego? <laughs> uh, all of the things that happen when people behave in ways that they cannot explain using any other terms except for words like selfless or heroic or courageous or martyr-like or divine. You know, all of those are very general, vague words that describe what happens when people draw on deeper resources in the self than the individual ego can provide. And there's an entire analysis of how all of that works. But, you know, if people don't want to do the reading, they're not going to find out what the analysis is. If you look at the early Platonic dialogues, where you really hear the voice of Socrates very loud and clear, you get the sense very strongly that philosophy was for Socrates both a practice and also a way of theorizing. And I think that because a kind of philosophy that makes demands on one to practice what one preaches are, are, are so rigorous
I think that that is one reason why Western philosophy developed in the direction of essentially abandoning the practical part and making philosophy just about reading and thinking and writing. But in the Eastern tradition, that practical part was not abandoned. For me, the practice of philosophy is the practice of disciplining the mind. You know, we have uh, some really interesting and uh, unexplored capacities for insight, for analysis, for consistency, for self-control through the intellect that, I, I mean, we, we just haven't even begun to tap them. But it is possible to do philosophy, and I'm talking about Western philosophy now, in such a way that it can tap those intellectual resources. And in particular, there's just this one little paradigm shift that we need to make. And that is to simply apply whatever the principles are that we are dissecting to the subject doing the dissecting. That's all we have to do. Um, because that's the point at which you see whether the principles are viable. Do they actually apply to your own behavior? Do they actually describe your own perception of the world? Do they actually conform to your understanding of your local environment? And see, that's something that philosophers tend not to enjoy doing because that level of self-consciousness, that level of quote-unquote navel-gazing is considered to be inimical to the practice of philosophy. But see, in the Eastern tradition, it's not. It's the whole point. So it's, deep, it's deeply, it, it, it's an ethical practice for you. In, in the end, it's an ethical practice. Even if you are doing logic, you're doing metaphysics, you're doing philosophy of language, you're doing decision theory, any of those fields that purport to have objective content, if they are objective, they also objectively apply to your own local situation. So, so, so that's the key move. And in fact, I talk about this um, uh, in Rationality and the Structure of the Self, this, you know, this tendency that we have to make judgments about all sorts of things without understanding our own violation of the principles by which we're judging. For example, I uh, go to dinner with my friends and, you know, we're kind of talking about our co-workers and, you know, telling all of these awful stories about them. And, and, and I say, you know, the, the thing that I, I just can't stand about Robert is that he's such a gossip, you know? I mean, he's always telling stories about... I mean, obviously, you know, the very principle that I'm using to make a judgment about Robert I am myself violating in the process of using the principle. Now, if we're not able to recognize that when it happens, then we're not able to see the ethical dimension of the practice of philosophy. But it's always there. Well, aside from Kant, I think the only real hero I had was my dissertation advisor, John Rawls. And I basically took my professional paradigm of how to proceed as a philosopher from Rawls. Rawls published a series of very important articles in his early career that became part of a theory of justice, his major work. It seemed to me that the way he proceeded was exactly the right way to proceed. To sketch out the problem in a general way, to then start refining different aspects of it, to zero in on certain problems and, and use this overall pattern of filling in, roughing in the details with each article that he did, which is basically the way he worked. Now, you know, as I learned to my dismay, <laughs> um, my tr professional trajectory was not going to be uh, like Rawls's. Uh, Rawls 
uh, got tenure at his first job. He went to Princeton. He went to Harvard. After he went to Harvard, he then published his major work, which was, which was his first book, after he was a full professor at Harvard. But even though my professional trajectory was different, it never shook my conviction that this was the right way to do it. You know, the right way to do it being to do the very best you could to produce one gem of an article after another, all of which would function as building blocks for this large gestalt project. That still seems to me the right way to proceed if you are a theory builder in philosophy. And, and he was um, really very helpful about this because he saw based on the work that I submitted to him, that I was a theory builder too. And he gave me very good advice. You know. Now, again, the fact that the advice and the manner of proceeding that he gave me worked for him and not for me <laughs> professionally doesn't mean that it wasn't good advice. It still was very good advice, and I'm glad I took it. Socrates is everybody's hero. You know, Socrates does not belong just to me. The Socratic ideal of doing philosophy is one of dialogue, and it's one that completely disregards relations of power or status between the speakers. It's simply an exploration and investigation of the ideas themselves and the merits of the ideas. And it uses the techniques that have become centrally definitive of Anglo-American analytic philosophy. The techniques of analysis, of using logic as a criterion for the validity of arguments. Th those are the things that characterize analytic philosophy, and those techniques originate with Socrates. I think Socrates took exactly the right attitude towards the problems and obstacles that he faced, and that attitude is the one that I think I should take towards the ones that I face. Namely, you, do, you just disregard them, and you just do the work. That's all. You just do the work. And if people get offended, if they strip you of your tenure, if they force you out of the department, that's the price. How personal is this book? Oh, it's very personal. My understanding of the way an anomaly functions as a disruption or violation of rational processes is absolutely based on my own experience of being an anomaly to other people and observing the way they behave. Absolutely. It's very personal. Could you play the, the way that you deal with that in terms of your philosophy versus the way you're dealing with that in terms of your art? Sure. In, in, in my artwork, I create anomaly. And in my philosophy work, I try to explain it. And is that essential relationship between the two practices? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the artwork, because of the values and the norms that define what a work of contemporary art is, aims to create anomaly in the viewer's cognitive capacities, aims to create a disruption of the viewer's conceptual scheme. And in that respect, my work is no different from the work of any artist. And in my philosophy work, I attempt to chart that conceptual scheme, to schematize it, and to describe the way it operates both in the ideal case and also when it is disrupted by the kind of anomaly that I am and that I create in my artwork. I'm wondering just why you find it so important to follow an idea yeah. to its end. Well, it's because I'm basically a 60s hippie at heart. 
And I believe that everything is connected and everything is significant. And the point of having an intellect, you know, the point of having a mind, is to find meaning, is to figure out what the connections are, to place any individual thing in its context, in its relationship to other things, and see the beauty of any kind of scientific investigation, any kind of intellectual investigation, is that you start realizing that those connections are in fact systematic. And so what you're doing is not really inventing something, you're discovering something. And it's just an awe-inspiring experience to do that. How do you know <laughs> when you've got the system right and when it's wrong? That's very hard to describe in language. It's simply an intuitive sense, which is perceptual and experiential and also conceptual, that everything is lining up, you know. That there's nothing you have to ignore in order for your system to work. You know, there's nothing you have to explain away. There's nothing you have to dissociate. There's nothing you have to make excuses for. You just see clearly, and the concepts and terms that you bring to the description of what you see are the appropriate ones. And it's, it's just lovely when that happens. It's very rare.